Hey guys, welcome to this periscope. I'm just gonna flip the How's it going? So for those who are watching this on replay, just wanna say hi. I think what I'm gonna end up doing with a lot of these posts is putting them on our YouTube channel called I Love the Book of Mormon so people can watch back later. So if you're watching this on YouTube, how's it going? We're gonna talk just about some of the misconceptions that the Book of Mormon clarifies frequently when I am talking with people um, online about the Book of Mormon. The first question they'll ask me is, we have the Bible, why do we need the Book of Mormon? And it's a really interesting thing for someone who, I grew up a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or Mormon or Latter-day Saint. And for someone who did not grow up a member of the Church of Jesus Christ and then just had the Bible and then later was able to see the Book of Mormon, I think for them it's a lot clearer the differences and the benefits and the blessings of the Book of Mormon. But uh, before I get into that, hi everyone who's watching. Thank you for joining. Feel free to tell me where you're from. Um, I'm a convert. Awesome. So you'll understand this a lot better than I will. Uh, my parents were converts as well. Um, so I get the question a lot. Boston. Awesome. I grew up in Hingham, Massachusetts. So I know Boston very well. Member of the Hingham Stake. Um, why do we need the Bible? Madrid, awesome. Hello, Madrid, Colorado. Awesome. Feel free to share this with your friends too. You can share it um, so more people can jump on because we're going to have a really good discussion and I want this to be a discussion. I'm going to kind of lead the discussion in at some points, but Georgetown, Massachusetts, awesome. Georgetown, Massachusetts. I don't, I don't think I knew there was a Georgetown, Massachusetts, but for those of you who are watching this on YouTube, you won't be able to see these comments, but people are commenting. St. Louis, awesome, thanks for joining. They're telling me where they're from. Um, Euless, Texas, great, Texas. Hopefully the weather's okay there. I know things have been um, kind of crazy out there. Um, and if you're wondering, yes, I am in a closet just because it's the quietest place right now. Um, but I'm gonna be talking about a book called The Infinite Atonement um, by Tad Callister. And in this book, he addresses this question. People will say, we have the Bible. We don't need, like, what need do we have for the Book of Mormon? And one of the things he talks about, this book obviously is about the atonement of Jesus Christ. Yeah, feel free to tap some hearts if you want. That's great, just so I know that you're awake. Um, appreciate those. You got the cool little 2016. Love that book. Yeah, I'm actually just starting reading it, but I've really enjoyed it so far. Um, one of the doctrines... Obviously, he's emphasizing the atonement of Jesus Christ, which we feel the Book of Mormon provides a lot of clarity on. And I'll talk about that in a future video. Um, but he talks about the doctrine of the fall. And he said it's one of the most misunderstood doctrines in Christianity. And he says, It seems paradoxical that the very doctrine that is essential to our salvation is also one of the least understood doctrines in the Christian world. So he talks about all this misunderstanding. So... Um, Maybe for those of you who said you were converts, maybe tap the screen or let, comment. Let me know what misconceptions you perhaps believed, but those were clarified with the Book of Mormon. That would be interesting for me to know. Um, he goes on saying, the misunderstandings, confusion, and doctrinal heresies associated with this foundational doctrine, speaking of the atonement, and its precursor, the fall, are rampant. So he goes on to explain some of these misconceptions taught by many in the Christian world today. Now, I served my mission in Panama, and I remember my first week hearing all these really strange, we were, um, it's predominantly Catholic in Panama, and a lot of the people who had questions, um, or, you know, when they'd give answers to questions we had, it reflected a lack of understanding. They believed in some things that I, I just had never heard before. Let me just read this list, and then we'll probably take, um, we're going to be reading a lot from, this is my 2 Nephi chapter 2, I think I'm at. So 2 Nephi chapter 2 in the Book of Mormon is such an, an amazing um, learning tool. Misconception, true love of Christ. Awesome. If you want to elaborate on that, are you? I know that some from some people they've talked about, um, you know, in their religion before they thought God was a God of anger, 
but they really learned about God's love. I converted from Catholic. Awesome. Um, so let me read this first first misconception. Um, and this is one I heard. I am an ex Jehovah's Witness. Awesome. Um, yeah, we also met with a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses, and I'll tell you, they knew the Bible very well, like as it related to their understanding. They had they studied it very very well. First misconception of the fall: Adam and Eve would have had children in the Garden of Eden if they had been allowed to remain, and we know that's not true. Um, they were in a state of innocence and would have remained. We'll read about that. I'm going to read the verse. Um, but that's the first misconception. Number two, Adam and Eve were not in a state of innocence in the Garden of Eden, but rather were experiencing unparalleled joy. That's another misconception. Okay. Um, and if you have any comments, you'd like to maybe bring something else up, I'd love to kind of dialogue with you guys and kind of talk back and forth. So please do that. Third misconception, the fall was not part of God's master plan but rather a tragic step backwards. It was a stumbling block, not a stepping stone in man's eternal journey. I like that Eve isn't blamed for the fall. Awesome. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of blame. And there's so many different stories. And, um, um, you know, I remember hearing people on my mission in Panama saying, oh, man, if they just hadn't partaken of that fruit, we'd be in peace. We'd be living in um, bliss. Um, and another thing is Adam and Eve are really looked down on. Um, but we revere Adam as a prophet, and we know that he was Michael before the earth was created, and he helped create the earth. Um, and Eve is just a glorious woman who we admire and love so much, but I know from other people I've kind of had experiences, but they don't feel that same way. Um, another misconception, who was blamed? Well, I think... Um, Eve was, from perspectives I've heard, Eve was given a lot of blame for everything bad that happened. I just love what you're doing right now. Thank you for that. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for tuning in. Um, again, if you go on YouTube and look up I Love the Book of Mormon, there's a YouTube channel where people all over the world are sharing verses from the Book of Mormon. Um, a lot of them are kind of on their own camera. But the fourth one, if Adam had not fallen, all of Adam's children would have been born in a state of bliss to live happily ever after in Edenic conditions. Okay, so those first four talk about Adam and Eve would have had children, would have been in a state of joy. Um, the fall wasn't part of God's master plan. Um, and we would live happily ever after. Now, I'm just going to turn to one verse in the Book of Mormon. And again, guys, please comment. I love your comments. I'll read them all. Um, feel free to tap the screen, show some love. Um, feel free to share this tweet with other people because they can join on. I'll probably be on for another 15 minutes um, just talking about stuff. And then later when this is over, I'll post this video on YouTube so people who are searching for questions about the fall or the doctrine of the fall, hopefully people who are trying to understand more of, of what this doctrine is, they'll find this video and maybe be pointed to the Infinite Atonement, this book, or even the Book of Mormon. Um, but Lehi in the Book of Mormon, he shares a verse um, in chapter 2, and he says, And now behold, if Adam had not transgressed, he would not have fallen. But he would have remained in the Garden of Eden, and all things were, which were created must have remained in the same state in which they were after they were created, and they must have remained forever and had no end. I used to be confused about the Trinity before I converted and the gospel helped to make sense. Awesome. Yeah, that's, again, I have a lot of dialogue with people who aren't members of the church because I try to kind of spread nods about the Book of Mormon and generally the comments I get are people who don't like it. <laughs> but one of the things I'll frequently have a hard time with is their understanding of the Trinity where they believe kind of God's one being. Um, but we believe that God, the Father, is a being of flesh and bone, perfected body. We believe the same of Jesus Christ, that he's a separate individual with a perfect body of flesh and bone, and that the Holy Spirit is a third being. They are one in purpose. Um, and it's interesting in the intercessory prayer when Jesus is praying to God, saying, I want my disciples to be one like us. I think that's one of the 
easiest ways to understand that the disciples and apostles, they all have their own bodies. I'm not thinking that Christ was saying we want them all to be one body. So to me, that's a clue that they aren't one body. Anyway, which makes more sense for me at least, and I'm not a member. Yeah. Oh, great. Thanks for the comment. Yeah, it makes, I mean, it, it seems to make more sense with Christ's baptism where the voice of God was in heaven and the Spirit came down as a dove and Jesus was in the water. And then Stephen, when he was stoned, if he if he he looked up in the heaven, he saw God and Jesus at his right hand. So there's, you know, there's lots of parts in the Bible where it shows them in different places. And um, but again, the doctrine of the Trinity or of God's true nature—that's one of the doctrines that was lost over time. And that's why it was important for Joseph Smith, who saw in a vision, he saw God the Father and Jesus Christ. That's kind of that was the purpose of that vision to help clarify that. Um, doctrine okay let me just continue reading really quick this one verse it says and they would have had no children wherefore they would have remained in a state of innocence having no joy for they knew no misery doing no good for they knew no sin so lehi was saying a little earlier in this chapter he says that you can't have sin without um he said that there's no law there's no sin if there's no sin there's no righteousness if there's no righteousness there's no happiness and Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden where there was no law. I mean, they, the law they were eventually given was don't partake of the fruit. Um, anyway, it's just a very interesting verse that Lehi shares. Let me go into misconception. This is number five. Because of the fall, all infants are tainted with the original sin. Again, that's, this is a misconception that many people in the Christian world believe. And if you want more clarification on that, there's a chapter in the Book of Mormon. It's Moroni chapter 8. Now Moroni, some people might not like what he says because he goes down pretty hard. I mean, he learns of a group of people in his land that were taught the true principles that you know children don't have original sin, do not need baptism. And he found out from his son that they were still baptizing him, uh, baptizing them. So Mormon, the father learns from Moroni that they're, they're baptizing children and he basically says look little children baptism is for repentance it's for those who are want to make a covenant with God and want to change the little children need no repentance neither baptism behold baptism is unto repentance to the fulfilling of the commandments unto the remission of sins but little children are alive in Christ even from the foundation of the world um, and he's saying how many you know, how many little children died with a baptism? Are you assuming that they're going to go to a hell because they didn't receive baptism? He's like, no, that's not. God's a God of mercy. That does not make sense. Um, but he goes on to say, um, little children cannot repent. So it's awful wickedness to deny them the mercies of God, just saying that they need a baptism. Um, but he's saying that all children are alive in Christ. Um, so that's one of these misconceptions of the fall is that there's this original sin, but Christ redeemed us from the effects of the fall. And we'll talk about that a little more, but another, this is misconception number six, six K okay. grace alone can save us regardless of any works on our part. Now, this is one of the biggest, uh, this is a, a very misunderstood doctrine, I think, even in the Mormon church about salvation and what you need to do to be saved. Um, at all of the religious world, it's a big debated point, and I think it's very misunderstood. Now, in this book, they want us to read from Second Nephi twenty-five twenty-three to talk about um, grace. And so I'm going to read this, but I'm going to have some interesting commentary on it. So this is Nephi talking about grace. He says, this is the end. Um, for for this end was the law given. Wherefore the law hath been become dead unto us, and we are made alive in Christ because of our faith. Yet we keep the law because of the commandments. That's the wrong verse, sorry. Okay. For we labor diligently to write to persuade our children and also our brethren to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. Okay, again, any comments, questions, if you want to invite people, you can do that by, I think there's a way to invite people and retweet this um, periscope to people. 
as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or Mormons or Latter-day Saints, we believe in a principle of salvation and exaltation. Okay, salvation for us is when we are saved from the effects of the fall. Now, the fall is when Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve partook of the fruit. They were cast out of God's presence, and their bodies were changed. So, so they there was a you call it the spiritual death, meaning they were removed from God's presence. But then they were prone to the not prone. They were um, how do I say this? They were, I can't, I'm losing my, death was, en death entered the world, and so did their, they were no longer innocent. They could choose for themselves, okay? We believe that through Jesus Christ, that separation from God or death, we believe that we will, everyone's going to be restored back into heaven, well, not to heaven, back into God's presence momentarily, um, so we'll all be resurrected. Best talk about grace. His grace is sufficient. It's a BOE talk by, by Brad Wilcox. Yeah, I've actually read that one, and I think it's great, and I wish everyone could read it. But I still think, even in that talk, um, there's still, like, it's still hard because there's this salvation where Christ saves us from death through the resurrection and also from sin or that separation from God where he brings us back into his presence. And he's like, you know what? I'll bring you back into his presence and I'll bring you back from death. And so we're, we're before God. And it says that in the Book of Mormon lots of times. There's lots of verses where it says the atonement of Christ restores us to God's presence. Now, Mormons believe in a principle called exaltation, where we believe that our ultimate goal is to be with God, but also to become like him. Now, exaltation is where our works come in to a point. Um, a lot of people think, you know, if I just believe in Christ, that, that's the only principle I need just to believe in him. Um, now, for salvation, Christ saves us, and there's nothing we can do. Like, I can't resurrect myself. I can't bring myself back into God's presence. Jesus Christ's redemption did that, okay? So there's no works that I've done to do that. Now, once I'm back in God's presence, I'm going to be judged, and I'll be judged on my works. Um, and based on my works, God will determine where I'm going to be living for eternity. And we believe in a judgment. We believe Joseph Smith received a revelation about the afterlife. Um, there's different degrees of glory based on the way you lived your life. And that's something kind of really foreign to other Christians. I think they don't necessarily agree with. They believe Christ saves, but so do I. Christ saves me from sin and death, from the effects of the fall, and brings me back into God's presence. I don't believe I will ever be equal to God. I worship only Him. Now, Sheila, I understand that completely, and I'm grateful for you saying that. I just want to pull out a, different, a few scriptures. One of them, uh, I just want to go to Matthew, because the way I've always looked at this any father, if we truly believe that God is our father, any father, when you have a child, you you want to teach him everything you can. Like you, you love them with all your heart. You want them to achieve everything that they can in life. And you want them to have everything. You have all the blessings and happiness and good times that you've ever had. You want them to have that. But you also, you want them to be better than you if, if it's possible. Like, Let's say you're in high school and you got a 3.7. You wouldn't want your kid to like do worse than you. You'd want them to even do better, and you'd help them to, to do better. There's a scripture in Matthew 5. Again, Sheila, this is kind of just to talk about that point, because, the, again, this is one of the doctrines that we believe is misunderstood, and uh, that the Book of Mormon and additional scripture and revelation and prophets that are on the earth again today can clarify Matthew 5.48, Jesus says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. We don't take that as kind of a, a nice thought. We take that as like a commandment from Christ. Like, I want you to be perfect like your Father in heaven is perfect. And there's other references where, you know, it talks about being as the gods. Um, we believe that we have... As children of God, God, we have this divine destiny. And that's, 
and and for some that might seem like um yeah join heirs with christ is another scripture in the bible people think that somehow we're taking something away from god if we want to be like him or it, it makes him any less of importance to us but i don't see that from my perspective but i just wanted to read um there's another scripture this is actually found in the book of mormon it's Moroni chapter 10, and I really love what it says. It basically, it's, it says, come unto God and be perfected in him. Okay, at the end of the day, when all of the dust settles, we're still going to have imperfections, and we're not going to be able to do everything right. But that's where the atonement of Christ comes in again, where it can perfect us. Um, and it says, if ye by the grace of God are, are perfect in Christ, you can in no wise deny the power of God. So believe that God's grace is sufficient for you, that by His grace you may be perfect in Christ. So we believe in the principle of grace enabling us to do that we could something we couldn't do by ourselves. Um, and again, that verse in Matthew five forty eight, where Christ says, "Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven, which is in per which is perfect." And then also, you know, be. I think it's Corinthians where it talks about being joint heirs with Christ. Or maybe it's Romans. And it says we're all children of him and joint heirs with Christ. I, I can't remember. But thank you for bringing that up. And thank you, Sheila, for your comment. And kind of explaining what you believe. Um, yeah, Romans. I think it's chapter 8. Now the last... There's two more uh, misconceptions of the fall. Number 6, we talked about was grace. Not, and then, you know, the thought that grace is the only thing we need. Now, from a Mormon perspective, LDS perspective, grace is all we need to be saved. Like, Christ is all we need. But again, we believe in this principle of exaltation, where we are judged according to our works, and then, again, the atonement of Christ can enable us to be more than we could be by ourselves. Misconception number seven, that the physical resurrection of the Savior was merely symbolic we will be resurrected as spirits without the limitations of our physical body. Um, and we believe that we will be restored to a perfect body in a perfect frame. Every hair of our head that has been lost will be um, given back to us again. This is in Alma 40, 23. Let me read it real quick. The soul shall be restored to the body. And the body to the soul, yea, and every limb and joint shall be restored to its body, yea, even a hair of the head shall not be lost, but all things shall be restored to their proper and perfect frame. So that's what we believe regarding that. And then number eight, the atonement does not have the power to transform us into gods. In fact, such a thought is blasphemous. So again, that's a misconception that most of the Christian world has. Again, this is according to our beliefs. And so we've seen some on here who've kind of said, yeah, I, I mean, I think I only worship God and I don't think we can become like him. And that's, I mean, a lot of people believe that. And again, we don't see it as something of us becoming people that can be worshipped. It's more of God is our father. We have a divine origin. He loves us and he wants us to be happy and to be with him. And he's given Jesus Christ to the world to save us from our sins and from death but also to enable us to do things which we couldn't do on our own. Want to be Christ-like. Yep, that's something that the gospel of Jesus Christ um, definitely teaches. In 3 Nephi 27, verse 27, it says, um, this is Christ speaking when he came to the American continent. He says, what manner of men ought ye to be? Verily I say unto you, even as I am. So again, he gives the injunction, you know, be as I am. So those are the eight misconceptions about the fall that the Book of Mormon helps clarify. And again, so just to kind of wrap things up, a lot of people will comment with me, to me and say, we have the Bible, we don't need additional scripture. Why do we need the Book of Mormon? And for even some members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who've been members their whole life and have had access to the Bible and the Book of Mormon, sometimes it's hard to understand, wait, what what are we truly getting from the Book of Mormon that's not in the Bible? Because we kind of see them as one group of scripture. Um, so sometimes it's good to analyze what we actually learn from the Book of Mormon that's not in the Bible. Anyway, if there's any comments on here, any other thoughts, I'd love to talk about something else. 
Um, do you guys have any maybe other things you've learned from the Book of Mormon that you think are important? I can address those. I think in my next Periscope, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, specifically at the atonement and what the Book of Mormon teaches about the atonement of Jesus Christ. Because there's some truths that the world in general doesn't know about. When you say atonement, that might that word might be a little foreign to some people. But we believe that's the um, death of Christ, um, his sacrifice on the cross, his death, and then his resurrection. But also we believe, you know, a lot of people in the Christian world believe he took upon the world, the sins of the world, but we believe he also took upon the sorrows and sadness and kind of not just the physical things that the world suffers with. But I think I'm going to wrap it up. I appreciate those of you who've been on this Periscope. Tap if there's anybody left. I think there's a few people. Feel free to tap the screen. I think that it's important to remember that God loves all his children all over the world. Yeah, exactly. That's And uh, yeah, thanks for the love. Thanks for the taps on the screen. It's fun to see the 2016 popping up. Um, yeah, there's... Uh, and I, I wish I had the verse right in front of me. I don't know if it's 2415 or 1524. The... I think it's 1524, when Nephi has a similar thought. He's like, you know what, there's so much... Um, I should know this. It's in 2 Nephi. Is it 2 Nephi? Is it 2 Nephi 1524? I'm not sure. But basically, he says... Oh, 2 Nephi 29. Yeah, there's there's also another one. It's a, it's a different reference, I think. Um... But says, you know, I don't understand everything, but one thing I do know is that God loveth his children. And everything that is done by the prophets and leaders of the church is to reflect that love of God that he has for his people. Anyway, I'm going to wrap this up. Thanks for hanging on this Periscope. Um, again, if you have other questions, you can feel free to contact me. You can email me um, at info at ilovethebookofmormon.org. You can email me there, or you can send me a direct message on Twitter. The handle's at bookmormontoday. And, yeah, Sheila, bye for now. Some interesting points I will think about. Yeah, Sheila, thank you so much for hanging out with us and for your comments. Bless you. Thank you for this, Al. All awesome. Yeah, thank you as well. And I've been... I. I did it more of these in the past. I kind of took a couple months off, but I'll be doing these kind of more often. Just um, one to kind of talk with you guys. and kind of, It's a lot easier when you're kind of just watching something on screen to kind of open up and kind of see what they're thinking. Um, but also, I'm going to be posting this video on YouTube so people who maybe have questions about the fall of Jesus Christ, excuse me, the fall of Adam and some of those misconceptions, hopefully they'll be landing on this video. Um, Leanne, yeah, thank you for joining. Um, it's good having you on here. And we will look forward to talking to you guys later. I'm going to sign off for now. Thank you. Happy New Year.